A lot of camera purchases are from the heart, with reasons like, it looks cool, or I want to shoot that style of camera, and it doesn't really make any sense, but you buy it anyway. Well, this camera purchase is entirely from the head, and it was the Fuji GW690 version 3. So, what is this monster? Well, it's a fixed lens, medium format rangefinder, affectionately known as the Texas Leica, for obvious reasons, from 1992 that shoots a glorious 6x9 frame. So why is this camera purchased from the head and not the heart? Well, it's because I bought it for the format and for the practical nature of the camera, not for its looks or styling. Now it did take a lot of careful consideration to arrive at this particular camera, and that is because I was looking for a portable camera with a large frame for landscapes and portraits, but was also practical for traveling. Now this actually ruled out any medium format SLRs due to the size and weight, and I wanted a six by nine format as I liked the three to aspect ratio. Now there are six by seven and six by eight versions of this camera, and there are other rangefinders in those sizes as well, but I don't like 6x7, and 6x8 is nothing I've ever really shot before, so I did want to take a gamble on a new aspect ratio at that time. As for the 6x9 format, it is something else to behold, and it is big as you can practically get handheld. It's actually five and a half times larger than the normal 135 frame, and it's about half the size of glorious 4x5 large format frames. Now the amount of details that can be packed into one frame of 6x9 on high quality film is honestly kind of obscene. I can't see anything. Man. Taking a picture, Paddy? Or selfie? <laughs> Slide film, to be honest. Slide film. So Taking a look at this, it's a camera. Amazing analysis, I know. But from the top, we have our winder over here, along with our shutter release button and the shutter release port as well. Next to that, we have the frame counter, which is right here. And then beside that, we have our little format switch. Now here we can actually switch the camera between 16 exposures for 220 film, eight exposures for 120 film and four exposures for short roll 120 format film. But now we have to leave this camera on 120 mode because 220 and short roll 120 film are no longer with us. Next to the format switch, we have our hot shoe and a bubble level. Looking down on the lens, we have our very nice and smooth focusing ring and underneath the built-in lens hood, we have our exposure controls. So the aperture on this lens can open all the way to 3.5, while the shutter speeds range from a one second all the way down to one five hundredth of second on this leaf shutter lens. Now it does have a T mode on the lens, which is a bit peculiar to use. We'll get back to that in a little bit. So adjusting the exposures on this camera can be a bit of a faff because 
the, these rings are actually quite small and if you're trying to use this camera with gloves or anything uh, you're just not using it you're just going to have to take your gloves off so moving around to the front of the camera we have our front shutter button and our locking switch and when the l is shown it actually locks both shutter buttons and you need to use this because you only get eight shots a roll on this thing so if you accidentally fire it you're going to be wasting quite a bit of film you might ask why the hell does it have a front shutter button well it's because if you're shooting in vertical mode you can cup the lens like this and hold the shutter button here it's actually a very stable way of holding the camera and it does make a lot of sense even if the button's in a bit of a goofy place Lastly, on the front, we have this little flap here, which covers up the flash sync port. Now, if we move around to the bottom of the camera, we can see the shot counter. Now, this shot counter is in 10, so this particular one has shot just about 2,930 shots. However, this shot counter is not actually intended to measure the age of the camera or in what kind of condition it's in. The reason for this is for maintenance, and after X amount of shots, you need to get the camera serviced or you're supposed to get the camera service nowadays that can be a bit of an issue but don't trust these shot counters because you can actually just take the bottom plate off these and reset these internally very easily so if you see one of these cameras on ebay that's beat to hell and back and happens to have a shot counter of six uh, don't trust that listing and let's move around to the back of the camera so to load the actual camera itself we just pull down on the little tab here on the right side which unlocks the rear door and it opens up like a giant 35 millimeter camera with a massive six by nine frame. Now on the inside of the door, we have our pressure plate and rollers and it currently says 120. Now you can actually switch this over and I believe it kind of flips over and that lets you shoot 220 film, but we ain't shooting 220 because that shit's gone. I'm struggling to open a pack of XP2 because foil so in order to release the spools, we just push down these red buttons, which unlock the pins. And then we can slot in our take-up spool really easily. We take our XP2. And we're just going to load that in here. And we're going to stretch across, as usual. Feed it into our take-up. Wind carefully. Now, one thing that's very important when you're loading this camera is you need to have the film under the correct amount of tension. So I actually put my fingers here on the feed roll and I make sure that I'm pulling with quite a bit of tension across. The reason for this is it may, we have to make sure that this here is taking up correctly and we're not rolling up a fat roll because it's very easy to get fat rolls in this camera. So now with that, we just wind all the way to here. Make sure we take up all the slack. Match the arrows. Close up the back and then we just wind to frame one nice and firmly. Make sure to stroke the camera firmly so you don't end up getting fat rolls. And with that, the camera is locked and loaded. So to unload, we just wind our film to the end as normal. And then we'll just open up our back. Like so. And then we can just pop out the spool and it lifts up on a little spring, which is much better than certain cameras that load like this. And then we just do the usual, you know, mmm, flavorful. Uh, we just do the usual 120 rolling. And there we go. You can see we didn't get a fat roll. Got some nice 
clean XB2 shot in this. And then we just move over our spool. Ta-da! Now, being that this is a rangefinder camera and incidentally my first rangefinder, using certain things on it can be a bit tricky like polarizers and graduate filters because you can't actually see through the lens in order to either place them correctly or to adjust the polarization until it makes sense. But even with those limitations, it does make using solid ND filters and color filters super easy to use because you're looking through a separate viewfinder window instead of through the lens. So they're not in your way, but you still get the effect in your shots. So the whole rangefinder thing is definitely a bit of a Faustian bargain. The filter thread is 67 millimeters, but because the lens hood is quite far out, we can actually use step up rings all the way to 77 millimeters. And that allows us to use larger filters while also maintaining the lens hood's functionality because you need to be able to pull the lens hood out in order to access the exposure controls on the lens. As for using this as a rangefinder, it kind of sucks. Okay, that's not fair. It works perfectly fine and on this actual camera the rangefinder is calibrated perfectly but the patch is really hard to see and it's a very small fuzzy circle. Now compared to something like a Leica's rangefinder or a Hasselblad X-Pan's rangefinder, there's just no comparison at all. This thing just is absolute ass in comparison. The viewfinder also features parallax corrected frame lines which are nice and accurate and using this as my first rangefinder, it did catch me off guard a little bit with the parallax error but I did get used to it pretty quick like this picture of my friend Danny shows where I was able to frame him very accurately. However, when he took the camera and took a picture of me, you can see how the viewfinder just completely threw him off and I'm not centered in the frame at all. Now this camera is a fixed lens camera which means you can't change the lenses. So the lens that's permanently glued to this beast is the Fujinon 90mm f3.5 and it is an amazing lens. Although on this particular camera you actually can't really tell it's a Fujinon 90mm because the like information writing piece of plastic thing that's glued onto the front of the lens has actually fallen off at some point so it's just a generic lens I guess right now. As for the performance of the lens it is as sharp as a tack with amazing image quality needed to fill that glorious 6x9 frame. Now even though 90mm does seem kind of long with the large 6x9 frame size it has the same field of view of around a 42-ish millimeter lens in 135 format or full frame if you speak digital. The longer focal length on this lens renders absolutely beautiful and it gives that medium format look really well with that shallow depth of field even at f5.6 or f8. Now this shot of Danny I showed earlier also shows this effect really well. Now if you fancy a wider lens version, there is the GSW version of this camera which has a 65mm f5.6 and that's about the equivalent of a 28mm in 135 format. Also if 6x9 is not your jam, there are actually 6x8 and 6x7 versions of this camera so if one of those tickles you the right way, you can buy one of them and as a rangefinder option they tend to be pretty decently priced compared to some of the competition like the Mamiya 7. Now the lens itself actually features a leaf shutter and it is a really quiet shutter and with the camera's girth it is extremely stable to shoot. I've shot sharp shots on this at 1 15th of a second handheld and it was very stable. Now I did say the shutter on this camera was quiet however the shot counter is not and that emits a loud clang sound every time you fire the shutter so it's definitely not a stealthy camera if the fact that it's a massive brick welded to your face didn't give you away already anyway. Now as for that T mode, it is strange because while it does lock the shutter open for long exposures, you can't actually close it by using the shutter button like most T modes on cameras and large format lenses. Instead, to close the shutter, you have to wind the film on and that actually leaves streaks on the film because you need to wind it a little bit in order for the shutter to close. So I got around this issue by going full 1890s and actually ending the exposure with a lens cap and then winding on the film and that prevents the streaking effect. 
Now another thing about this camera is that it is completely mechanical as well. So there are no batteries and no light meter. So when I'm actually shooting this camera casually, I use this TT Artisan meter just clips into the hot shoe. And if I'm shooting something a bit more detailed or I want a bit more control or slide film, I use my Pentax digital spot meter to get my exposure bang on the money and let that slide film shine in the 6x9 format. Now you might think that having a fixed lens camera is a deal breaker, but honestly, it just kind of isn't in practice. The lens is actually a really nice focal length for me to be stuck with and not having to choose which lens to shoot actually makes the shooting experience much easier and more creative in a way. Finding compositions that work with it is really nice rather than fretting about which lens to use and ending up wishing you had the one lens you had inevitably left at home with you. So that is why this camera tends to come with me on trips like when I hauled it up to Lugnaquilla on a wet day or when I brought it to Kerry for two days of driving around the ring of Kerry. Now when it comes to traveling it actually surprised me that even though this shoots a massive 6x9 frame the camera is actually quite compact and light you know relatively speaking. It's not a Eureka GR1 here, but compared to something like a D850 with a 50mm uh, f1.8 G lens, the 690 is actually smaller vertically and about the same depth while being quite a bit wider, but that does mean it fits into smaller camera bags designed for DSLRs without it digging into your back like other cameras that are way too tall and just don't fit in most camera bags. Also, when it comes to the weight of this camera, it's actually about the same as the D850 with a 50mm prime, so if you're used to hauling around a full frame DSLR and one or two lenses, this camera is not going to be an issue at all. Now you might read about this camera online and how the build quality of the version 3 is like, uses a lot of plastic and it's really bad, but actually that's just not the case. Uh, the underlying frame of the camera is all metal and all the internal components seem very solid and well built. I haven't ran into any issues with this camera at all in the last year of shooting and the build quality just seems to be absolutely fine apart from a few scuffs I've got on the plastic. So that is the reason why in a few weeks time this camera is coming with me across the world to Japan for a month while I shoot film there. And I think with that I've covered all the bases on this camera. It's a really nice camera and I really enjoy shooting it. I don't shoot it all that often because there's not as many times where I actually need a massive 6x9 format camera. But when I haul this up somewhere to take a big landscape shot, the amount of detail you can capture in that gorgeous frame just makes it worth it every single time. And I think, you know, for the amount of money I paid for this camera, I got a pretty good deal because of the missing faceplate. But overall, for the amount of money you pay for this and what the images it can produce are, I think it's a solid pickup and I really, really like it. So with that, I'll see you next time.